Roy, thank you very much for joining us. Um, look, you're 76 years old. I know at this stage of your career, people are always going to mention your name. It happened to me at the end of my career, even though I was nowhere near your age. 22 different clubs in eight countries. I want to put you on the spot. Is there one moment, one club that you kind of like, or yeah, game, whatever it was, that you kind of stands out for you of that was something r- remarkable when you look back at it? Well, there's several, Mark. Obviously, if you go back that length of time, and I, I suppose the ones that, if I have to stay closer to you, are either ones a really long time ago yep. or ones that were a bit more recent. I mean, the one a long time ago really was was when we won the championship at Harmstead in 1976, and that was against all odds, really, in every respect. And we did it you know, with some style and some panache. So I could pick out a lot of individual games there, but I'll take that as a as a whole, if you like. But then if you're talking about an individual game, it'll be one that you played in. That was, you know, when Fulham beat Juventus, when really and truly we were out. You know, we were, in most people's eyes, out of the competition, which we'd done brilliantly well in to get as far yeah. as we did. But the defeat in Juventus by two goals, most people thought, well, that's that's Juventus through. And then when they scored very early on in the game, and now they had a, a three-goal margin, to pull that around... Uh, I've got no idea how you guys did it, but I'm very <laughs> grateful. Oh, well, we all did it. And the thing is, when you watch back at it, did Clint mean it? Well, that's the <laughs> other thing. Isn't it? He, he, <laughs> what do you think? He, he would swear <laughs> that, that he did, and who am I, who am I to gainsay him, really? <laughs> um, is, there a, is there a club or a moment you look back at and you would go, if I could do it over again, I'd like to go back there and go, right, let's start again and let, give me another go at that one. Is there anything? I think there's lots of clubs I could look at in that where I think I've not done the sort of job that I could be proud of when I left the club um, for various reasons. Um, that's not necessarily ones where I've lost the job. I mean, Blackburn, after a very good season, sacked me halfway through the second. But I, I don't look back on that and, and think that was a massive error for my part. But there were one or two jobs I'd taken on. Uh, there was the one in Switzerland when I went back to Grasshoppers. Shouldn't really have done that. Uh, when I left FC Copenhagen to go to Udinese, shouldn't really have done that. And on, on each of the occasions, really, I've gone into those jobs, I, I think, probably not fully um, as aware as I should be of what I wanted to bring to that club and what I needed to do and, you know, why I've been selected for, for my strengths. I didn't use them. I had maybe other things going on in my head and often, I suppose, it's disappointments from a previous job. So there's lots of jobs like that I could look at and say, but I, I suppose I should also, after such a long career and, and, and having taken on so many jobs in different places, I should be kinder to myself and be grateful for the ones that went well rather than to highlight the ones that I wish I'd have done better at. 47th year in management. How has your approach to the game changed or has it at all? I think they're, they're very difficult questions because... You know, you don't really see yourself as others see you anyway. We all know that. And I think when you look back and people say, well, you know, what was the difference? Let's forget 76, because that was uh, with part-time football in Sweden. But let's, you know, let's, let's even just go back as far as Blackburn in, or Inter in, in, in the mid-90s and today. One is tempted to say the change is enormous, but one really could also say that it's, it's the superficial things in the football that's changed. The actual basic principles that you work on, both in terms of your coaching and your leadership and your man management and dealing with people, that really shouldn't change as much as all that, I don't think. And I'd like to, I'd like to think I haven't changed enormously in that respect. But, of course, the adaptation to the way that the game has moved on in, what's that, 95 is almost 30 years, isn't it? Yep. You know, of course it moves on. Everything moves on. You know, what is, the, what is the same today as it was 30 years ago? You know, I was running around trying to find a phone booth that was, that was not vandalised to make a phone call to my wife in the old days. Now, now you just pick up the mobile phone and there she is. So things have changed and players have changed. Of course yeah. they have. The game's changed. But I think it's naive of people to think that it shouldn't change. I mean, of course it's going to change. And we who are working in it, if we want to continue working it at a, at a later stage of our lives, we have to adapt to that change. But the adapting to the change is in, in the superficial areas, i.e. understanding that the player's culture is a bit different today, the way they, 
the way they deal with each other, their backgrounds, coming through academies has made, you know, but that's, I think that's quite an easy thing to adapt to in some ways, as long as you don't want to become the player's best friend and spend 15 minutes every morning discussing the latest pop star or the latest <laughs> pop video, because you'd be, you'd be out, in, out on a limb, you, you don't, don't know say, them. Would you know who they are? Well, that's the point. Isn't it? You have to be very careful, and you have to do it with uh, an analogies and, and, and you know referring to people because you know every generation has its person that it refers to as a, well. Everybody knows them. You listen to old pop songs, you know, like uh, even Lana Turner's "Smile" in a song in the fifties. I mean, I mean, even I don't remember Lana Turner. So you've got to be careful of that that you you don't throw out too many. So. I still do, of course, but if I do, I, I immediately laugh about it and say, I don't expect you to know who that is, but this is the one we used to use to prove this point. Um, with, when you talk about referring to the players and dealing with players and cultures and different type of upbringing, people from all over the world, have you taken a more hands-on approach or something that you've still managed more from a distance? Because that was like at Fulham. You, you kind of rarely, very, very rarely had to step in with anything. You kind of let the group get on with it. You know, mm. core group of good players, senior players, you kind of almost gave that responsibility. Mm. Is that the same still today? Yeah, I think it probably is. I mean, I think that I think you can <clears throat> take away too much responsibility if you're not careful. But I do think the players, uh, they require and appreciate leadership. If you remember when, well, you weren't there when, when uh, Kelly and I came, came in straight away and we took over a very different group of players to the group that you're yep. remember. We half put that group together by people we know and the, the characters we wanted. Before that, you know, it was a very, very different situation. And there we we stepped in quite quite violently really, even to the extent of removing some people from the group we wanted to work with, because they were such negative influences, and giving a bit more responsibility to those ones who we thought did want to be there with us, did want to do the work that we thought was needed and were prepared to put their bodies on the line to do it. And luckily, in that, in particular there, there was Danny Murphy and, and Brian McBride, those, those two guys, Hangeland and Hughes at the back, you know, people like that, Bairdy. You know, they were guys really that we knew, OK, if we can keep these guys with us, they'll try their best to help us get our principles across. So when you came, we'd already established quite a lot and then one or two other players we brought in, notably yourself, but also uh, Andy Johnson and Bobby Zamora, Damien Duff. These guys we brought in who also were not only the right types, they were the right players we needed and made us a much better team. And then when you've got that, you can give a little bit more responsibility and you can hope that those guys will echo your messages in terms of the principles of play, but also echo your messages in terms of how you expect the team to behave and, and, and talk to each other and, and deal with each other. Because if you remember, one of the things that I was always very uh, unhappy with is when players started abusing each other in training sessions. You know, I didn't want, I, I wanted to say, look, if someone needs really telling off or really needs upbraiding because he's not doing the right thing, that's, that's my job, you know. Your job is to be his teammate. Yep. And, but on the other aspects where you can step in, I got a lot of help, and that's always been the case here at Crystal Palace. You know, in the four years before I was invited back, and now in the last eight or nine months I've been here. Two questions, really, um, that just reminded me of our time. Um, I, when people ask me about what were you like as a manager, I said, you know, for all the normal things of organised and structure, and, and everybody knew exactly what they were doing, I said, the one thing also is that he spent pretty much 95, 96% of the time on the training field taking every single session. Do you still do that now? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, get, I delegate more than I, than, I, than I did. I mean, over the years I have delegated more, but that's part, partly because, not because I don't think I could do it or want to do it, it's because I felt that I probably wasn't really using my assistance enough. So, for example, with Ray Lewington and Kelly, I had two excellent people at Fulham here with Ray and, and Paddy McCarthy. I've got coaches who are every bit as good as I am on the, on the coaching front. It's wrong of me if I push them to the side to watch me work all the time. But no, I never miss a train session. I never, I'm never not on the field, and I still am pretty active in, in most of the sessions. And even if someone else was taking the session, like Paddy McCarthy might be taking a passing possession, 
both Ray and I will be there, you know, encouraging, really, and giving people the odd tip or hint. And have you changed your look on small-sided games? Because you used yes. to hate them. Yeah. You used to get so angry when the players start to call out for small-sided yeah, games. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> when you, you asked me earlier, are there things you regret and got wrong? That was actually <laughs> one of them, because, you know, now I'm very much in favour of them, and especially in terms of finishing off a session whereby maybe there's been quite a lot of tactical work done. Um, I think there's less standing still now anyway. There's probably more standing still in our coaching in the, in the Fulham days even to get the messages across. Now we, we use this video screen and we do the videos and we've got that extra tool, if you like, at our disposal. Um, so we try to keep the sessions ticking along and so a lot of the coaching will be done without necessarily stop dead and walking people through. We still do a walk through, but we tend to do that the day before the game. The rest of it, we're trying to find practices where we're getting out of it what we want. And then it's the odd stoppage, or when you bring the players in, you, you, you talk about it. So I think even in that area, that's where the small-sided games come in, that after you've been doing that some time, and you feel the players have had a lot to concentrate on, and a lot going on in their heads, for the fun of it, but I don't use small-sided games as a, a coaching tool very often. I use them more that, right, we get the size of the pitch right. You know, you know if we want to work a bit harder, we make it bigger. If we want to, work, we want it to stop you working too hard because a game coming up, it'll be a bit smaller. Get some decent rules in there so people don't start taking liberties, and then let them get on and enjoy it. So uh, I'm, I'll thank you for reminding me about that. But. I, <laughs> If, if I ever meet Bobby Zamora, I'd have to say to him, Bobby, you were right and I was wrong. Um, there's one more thing I want to remind you about. We, we played Roma. We lost in Rome. Two players sent off. Paul Konczewski and uh, Eric Neverland came on and got sent off. And after the game, obviously, everyone was disappointed. Everyone was angry. You were livid. And he said, I don't care. We'd, I'd already been to a final and lost it. I don't want to go to another bloody final. And that was it. And it always stuck with me. And the next game, we played Basel away. It was a must win. And I remember saying it in the, in the pre sort of like uh, in the huddle in the, in the change room and referring to it as I'd been to a final, lost it, but I'd give everything to go back there again. It's kind of, kind of right, right? Absolutely. That journey yeah, to go yeah. through it. Yeah, I'm afraid one, say, one says things sometimes in the, in the heat of the moment that you don't, you don't want to stand for. <laughs> as, uh, well, I mean, I think I was at that stage, living was the right term, and if I could have been put in a room alone with a referee, it could have been even more problematic uh, at the end of that <laughs> game. So... So uh, you're right and I was wrong. Of course, every game, once you lose that feeling that every game is one that you really believe in, that you want to win it, that you're going to be very happy when you do win it. And I remember how angry we were um, with the England when we, we actually provided our own celebration before a friendly match after we'd qualified. You know, to play 10 matches and get 30 points and to go through the whole qualifying campaign Unbeaten. I don't care who it is or who you're playing against. I mean, Man United are struggling to beat FC Copenhagen last night. I mean, every game's a tough game to play. Um, I thought that just passed virtually unnoticed, that people didn't care. Well, we know you're going to qualify. So we actually made it. And I remember saying to the players then, listen, don't forget, every win, every success, you have a footballer, make certain you celebrate it. Because you're, so, you're always going to suffer when it doesn't go well and you're always going to be hurt by the criticisms and you're always going to blame yourself for certain things because you're winners basically that's why you play the game so don't forget as a winner to celebrate the successes as well otherwise it becomes skewed your your life becomes skewed you know you you take the success for granted but every time you don't do well you're down in the dumps so you've got to keep that balance i mean balance is the big thing in life isn't it absolutely it is um <clears throat> Another question I have to ask you: How long will you continue? Any time? I mean, I can't imagine you got a time. Like you're just going going with the flow. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it was. Um, I really enjoyed the, the end of last season. I didn't know if I would, and I was very surprised to be brought back in. And I honestly thought at the end of that 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 would be it. I expected that. I wasn't pushing to continue. And in fact, my discussions with the chairman were basically: It's been great. And you know, so pleased that you can sort of finish on a high in a way. So when he actually asked me to come back and probably finish on a low, I suppose I should have had, <laughs> I suppose I should have had a few alarm bells ringing. But what brought me back 
was the club to some extent. You know, the chairman, Doug Feeman, the people around the club, Joanne, all the people I worked with, and in particular, of course, the staff and the players, because I knew that it might not be quite as euphoric as last season's ending was with everyone speaking so well about us and you know, really admiring the style of play and how we were playing football. It probably won't be that. It'll be a little bit more like the four previous years where there's a lot of digging in to do and a lot of defeats to suffer. But I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, at least I'm doing it in the environment that I, to some extent, have had a hand in, in, in forming and I'm doing it with people that I really like and care for. And I know that they'll be as upset as I am if it doesn't work out. So... Why not do it? But I've got a, a pretty, I'm pretty sanguine about the whole affair. Um, and I'm in that luckier situation than most coaches, who when they get a Premier League job, it's the, the start, if you like, of a big career perhaps, or else it's maybe the pinnacle of their career. For me, it's a very important job to do at a club I want to be at and want to work for. So I'm prepared to happily do that job all the time they say, we want you to do it. But the day they come and say, look, we've decided now we don't want you to do it anymore, I would quite happily walk away and, and, and leave them to it. Well, I hope that continues longer. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Eze and uh, Elise, big losses. You've had them out yeah. of the team for a while. Um, how big a challenge has that been for you? Because they're such mm. talented players. And, and how long do you think it will be until any of them, either of them are back? Yeah, well, I mean, Elise hasn't played at all this season. He yeah. got injured in the, in the uh, international break after the season ended. As he got injured after, he missed the, one of the first five or six games, then he got injured in about the fifth game, fourth or fifth game, but he already missed one, so he's probably only played three or four. And of course, for all clubs, you take two of the most important attacking players out of the team, your chances of scoring goals and dominating matches and doing very well offensively, you're reducing it by an enormous percent. We've had to deal with that. Um, they are both approaching, I think, the time when they'll get back. But I think, you know, with, with a guy like Elisa, he'll miss, he'll miss over a third of the season, which is going to be tough for us. Uh, and Ebbs might miss something like about 15 to 20% of the season. But hopefully they will come back. And when they come back, if we don't get hit by another big bout of injuries, we will be a much stronger team. And then I'll be seeing, hopefully, a bit more what I saw at the end of last season because we, we had much stronger attacking possibilities with those two players than when you take them out of the team and I think that would go for any club you know if I if every time we play a game of football I could pluck out the two most dangerous opponents in my eyes we'd win more matches Absolutely um, Newcastle last week was a, a heavy defeat how do you react to that how do you approach it with the players is it one of those ones where you just put it behind you and go it's just a bad one day at the office and move on? Or is there a, a, like sort of extra analyst analysing of that game? Yeah, there was a, a lot of analysing. There was a lot of anger, really. Not, <coughs> not because of any technical mistakes, but because I don't think we got anywhere near to playing the way we wanted to play in, in, in that game. And, you know, the principles that we work on... Uh, they were harder to see and harder to find in that game, and that's unacceptable. So it's unusual for us to be as quite as um, aggressive in our in our post-match analysis, and to be quite as um, vicious is probably too strong a word, but but um, unaccepting of what people have actually done, what a lot of players have done, because very few players in that game came out of it with any credit at all. It would have been easy for us to do what you said. Look, they're a very good team and you know they're the worst possible team for us to face in some way with their style of play. I mean, their style of play is very specific and a very difficult one to deal with and you need certain players in your team of a certain type if you're going to do it and we don't have many of them. So we could quite easily say, look, you've done okay in the first eight games, you've, you've done pretty well, so let's just forget about this one. But we chose not to. We chose not to largely because of the, the brist or, 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 the, or the absence of us doing what we said we'd set out to do. Friday night, you come up against Tottenham. 
And of course, um, as an Australian broadcaster, we have huge interest in the sure. game with Ange Postacoglu. Of course. What have you made of his start to his Premier League career? And also, how different are Tottenham now to the one, the one that you sort of faced last season? Well, he's done a fantastic job. There's no doubt about that. He's, I think he's brought in leadership skills as well. You know, that's probably partly unnoticed because everyone just wants to put it down to the fact that you know, he's got some very athletic players now, so they can press for, press a lot more from the front than maybe they've done in the past. That brings a bit more excitement to the game, and he's got a lot of quality in the team anyway. So people suddenly are putting it down to, well, you know, he's waved the magic wand over the technical side of the team, which maybe has. I can't say. They, 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 they certainly are playing in a way that's going to be difficult for teams to confront them uh, because they've got the technique and the physicality. But I think he's probably with the. Uh, I know him a little bit, and, you know, his way of being, his, his style his leadership and management style, I think that's something that Tottenham have perhaps needed as well. I think he's, he's brought it back to the playing field, what needs to be done, the principles, how we're going to play the game, what we're going to do, we're going to work at it in training, I'm going to get behind you and back you up, and maybe a little bit away from the more... Um, I, I want to be careful what the words I use sort of more aggressive stance perhaps that uh, a Jose Mourinho or a Conte might have had in terms of like you guys aren't doing what we think you should be doing because you're a good quality player. It seems to me that he's, he's brought it back to a more team-like environment which you've alluded to from, from Fulham which I thought was very good in that respect and uh, here at Crystal Palace and the quality of the players is there of course so if, if you get that right and you get them all singing off the same hymn sheet and you've got them really wanting to do what they suggest and agree as a team we're going to do, you can have a lot of success and at the moment they're looking very, very good and I wish it wasn't them we were meeting after a 4-0 defeat last weekend. Oh, I wish you all the very best. Thank no, you thanks, very much Mark. for your time. Not at all, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Roy. Did you enjoy that? There's so much more, so why not hit subscribe and download the Optus Sport app.